So we are here with Professor Didier Quillot, uh, who was just awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2019 for the discovery of the first extrasolar planet around a solar type star. The name is 51 Pegasi B. And uh, it's been so nice to have us here asking him some question. And this question comes from the student after an outreach activity uh, that was promoted from, by the uh, region Le Marche in Italy. So we will have a couple, maybe four or five questions for you. And uh, should we start with the one oh. from the student directly, yeah? Okay. My pleasure, yes. <laughs> Um, have you ever come across uh, obstacles in your career that made you think uh, to give up everything? Oh, interesting questions. <laughs> um, I think when you, when you do research, you come across a lot of obstacles. Um, but usually your motivations for what you're doing I mean, is, is so strong, so it doesn't really prevent you mm -hmm. to try. And um, I, I usually my advice is... Uh, uh, if you want to be a successful scientist, uh, the first things you have to learn is uh, how you're going to fail, because you will be failed most of the time. Most of the stuff you're doing uh, will fail. It's part of the science, uh, because you're so much exploratory. You don't know what you mm -hmm. really want, are going to find. Um, and you should accept it, um, and, uh, because sometimes you will be successful. So, so that guess, that is why I'm, I'm this kind of failure management um, uh, it certainly uh, is part of me, and I'm used to it, and doesn't change my motivation. So some of the big questions they wanted to ask were, how did you know that astrophysics was your, your passion? Did you know that from the early age? Did you change your path in between? Uh, how did you arrive to study physics and astrophysics? Was that you know, something linear or a little bit more, bit more of a... You know, they, the question I got very often is, oh, uh, uh, did you build your telescopes or did you start? And actually, I keep saying, no, <laughs> I never built any telescope. Um, I think the reason why I became a scientist um, is because I was really curious. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be, I think, I think it's the essence of any science, is you have to be curiosity driven. And um, I'm curious since, since I'm very young. I'm curious, uh, but my curiosity um, never stopped to astronomy. Of course, astronomy is fun because you can see the stars and there's kind of a black hole, the beginning of the universe, and very big questions you very early on I mean, want to understand. There's also all the sci fi, you know, Star Trek movie, the, all this, so there's full fantasy around it. But, but I was also curious about anything else. Um, I'm, I was agile in the mathematics, rational thinking, so it helps, certainly here. Um, but I've always been curious about anything. So, so at some point I decided that the best way to uh, feed my curiosity would be uh, to learn. So I decided let's, 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 go to, uh, let's go to school and let's go to school as much as I can. And I went to uh, what's called a college in, uh, in Switzerland which is um, um, between um, um, 16 and, and 19 years old. And, uh, and I decided that any kind of what I would pick is, would be more about science stuff, because mm -hmm. I, I, I like science, I was curious, but science could be anything. I mean, um, um, I mean psychology is part of science, and in a way, and, and I, I'm, I, I used to uh, like reading a lot, so I was curious about anything, history, about not only physics, chemistry, biology, anything, anything that I could learn about. Um, and then um, um, came up the big questions, what to do next, and I decided that because I was not sure exactly what to do, I would try to do something that would give me all the opportunities. And, uh, and that's how I decided to go for physics, because physics is quite often seen as the, the kind of basic for everything and there's lots of physicists that at the end became doctors or doing biology and many things. So I decided to go for physics um, and when I was studying physics I fall in love about physics. I think it was great and, and, and all the skill I had in mathematics helped me. And then astronomy was part of it and I must say I picked astronomy because I found the, the lecture was a bit more interesting than others um, and um, 
I like the idea uh, that to be outside, to go to beautiful places with telescopes, I think it's fun to go to places. And I was going to Chile, going to Hawaii, mm -hmm. and I thought it would be better than to stay uh, maybe at the sun and doing experimental setup. So, so at the end, it was really an um, emotional decision. Um, um, also, I've been influenced by some of the books I read. I mean, Carl Sagan certainly uh, had an impact on me. Uh, in, in the French language, we have uh, Hubert Reeves, which is someone I read when I was maybe 16 years old, 17 years old. So there's a lot of elements together uh, that directed me to astronomy. And uh, I decided to pick this work that led to the discovery of the planet because um, when I met Michel Mayer for the first time, I, I decided it's a really cool guy and I want to do a PhD <laughs> with this guy. I didn't care about the topic, I just wanted to work with him. Yeah, that's, that's so it's, it's amazingly emotionally driven decision. It's not very rational. Yeah, so you have a person generally that Motivation. motivates you, yes. you know, to, to reach and go beyond yeah. that. But you know, my parents are not scientists. I mean, yeah, my, my father is an accountant, my, yeah. my mother, and she used to work in, a, in office, and then she did teaching after that. So, I mean, I mean, uh, um, young, young, young kids teaching. So, Nothing to me was directed me into this. Um, I was the first one. I mean, you know, reached the the, the 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 PhD. Oh yeah, I'm the first one in the yeah, family yeah, doing exactly. a PhD, and even having a having a, a, a university um, a master, I was the yeah, first one yeah, in the family. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, a degree as well. Yes. Because my mother started but never finished, so mm. then she got pregnant with me, and then yeah. there was it. <laughs> oh well, well. Um, I saw uh, online the speech that you gave when you received the award yes. for the Nobel Prize and I really liked your speech because you started explaining practically that um, an achievement such a discovery that has been 51 pegs a B, you don't do it alone but there's a team of many people uh, with technical skills, with different mind thinking, with different um, bits and pieces that all come together to make actually the discovery possible because yes. at that moment you are doing what is impossible to be done with that instrument and with that yes. uh, uh, things that you have on end. So I'm curious actually, the students are curious to know how much creativity is embedded in the research uh, exercise that brings you to a big discovery like 51 pegs a day. Well, um, I think there's a lot of similarity between an artistic, um, I mean, drive and a scientific drive because you have to go beyond what is the usual stuff. So you have to get creativity as part of it. It has to be embedded into it. And, and actually the one that pushed the boundaries are the ones that are the most creative. But, but you cannot do that alone because you, it, it's, it's, it's a big build up because you're using tools that uh, is based on, on the result of other people. And it's, it's a big build up, it's a big pyramid. Everybody's bringing pieces here. So I think at the same time, you have to acknowledge the fact that alone, it would be impossible to do it. And you really build on, there's a famous sentence that, is, uh, that Newton, Newton said, and we are now in the College of Newton here, and he said, um, um, I, am, I have been lucky because I was sitting on the shoulder of giants, and the giant he was talking about was Galileo, one of them, and Kepler, and, and the way he established the Newton theory, because before Galileo and, and, and Kepler had established other theory he was building on. So, so science is about this. So I think it's, it's so natural to recognize, and, and when you get the prize, in a way, it's, it's unfair, because they give it to very few people, where there's a lot of people behind, but there's always something at some point that makes you a little bit different, that push the boundary, and, and that's how you can get something a bit unusual. And, and some of us get a bit more lucky, there's luck also part of it, and or doing the right stuff at the right time with the right mindset. Yeah. And it leads to major discovery. And that's it. Yeah, indeed. Keep an open mind all the time. Yeah. <laughs> the box. Uh, so there is another question that all the students have wanted to ask. I don't know if you want to ask it yourself about, you know, objective. Uh, what is your um, object of 
at you, the time. You mean by my goal? Yes. What I'm trying to do. Goal. Do you think novel is something to arrive to, or do you think that's much more beyond? Well, that? I mean, a Nobel Prize is an amazing recognition of the work. So, mm -hmm. so in a way, it's a gift, and it's responsibility because people expect you to use this for good. So there is a dimension in the Nobel Prize, which to me is the communication aspect. That's why I pretty much often try to dedicate part of my time to respond to interviews like this, because I think we're visible and we have to explain what is really the science and what is the reason why we do science and why it's so cool to do science. I mean, we would love to have more people, especially more women, into science. We have no, Italy is pretty good on that, but, but other countries are really bad. So we're trying to explain that we should have at least half and half, otherwise something is wrong because the, the brain are the same. So, so, um, so I'm using this for, for that. No, no, um, my, my research has, has not, hasn't changed. I mean, I, I started to work on, on, on discovery of planets. Um, now we have more than 4,000 4, planets, which is known, and we know the planet are pretty common on the, in the universe. But we also learn that most of the systems are very different from the solar system. So we don't really understand um, why. We don't really understand the nature of this planet. Um, are they more uh, Jupiter or Neptune mm -hmm. or Earth? Or are they in between all of this? What does it mean? So there's a lot of effort right, on this. So I'm part of this global exercise. I'm doing no more or less than the others. I'm part of big experimental setup. Uh, um, and uh, recently I'm just running a satellite called Kyops. So we, we successfully launched the satellites and we just heard that no, uh, everything seems to be great and we're yeah. starting observation of the satellite. So, so this is my, my, my contribution to that. But also along um, all this work, I, I uh, got more and more interesting But what is next. And, and what is next after Discovery Planet is asking the question of the origin of life and how far you can life in the universe. And I've been doing some work recently with some colleagues here and also other university, trying to um, to to find out um, how to ask the questions because it's very very complicated. What does it mean detecting life? I mean, uh, what is the origin of life on Earth? What we should be looking at? Should we be looking at something which is exactly like Earth, or something which is different? And if it's different, how do you recognize this life? It's very, very complicated. So I started to um, 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 spending more time on that, um, uh, and then trying to convince colleagues to also spend more time <laughs> with me on this. Uh, and now we we are into a situation where we're building up a momentum uh, with different fields. Um, the question goes beyond astronomy. Uh, it's a question that's also for geophysics because the nature of the geology um, has an impact. It's always a good example is Venus. Uh, mm. You go back in time one billion, billion years old. Venus was about like the Earth. It was a blue planet. Maybe with life. Maybe we're coming from Venus. It's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. It's not the case right now. Venus is not good, and uh, because something changed in the geophysics in the planet, and the plate tectonics, you know, will stop or never really uh, started, or, or then you cannot recycle the CO2. We're talking about about global warming, CO2. Actually, this is what's behind at some point. If you don't recycle the CO2, it just warm up the planet, and that's what you end up. So, so geophysics is very critical here to understand this. Now, you also need to understand what is life. How do you make life? And life is a kind of chemistry very special chemistry, uh, and then you need to talk with people that know something about chemistry, so, or chemists, or yeah. geochemists, or, or people doing molecular biology, or so the, the, the building blocks of life from the chemistry perspective. So there's a new field right now which is starting to be developed, uh, which is, let's say, the question of life in the universe, and it's getting all these people together. So the Nobel Prize is good for that because I'm becoming more visible, mm -hmm. so I can talk to these people, they don't ask me who I am, they know who <laughs> I am, and they acknowledge what we're doing in astronomy. I'm trying to bring the enthusiasm, I'm trying to convey here to you, to other, my, other of my colleagues doing yes. something different, uh, in a way we, we try to, to do some progress here. It's going to be some way, um, but we're getting small results here and there, and, and, um, and maybe you will see the result. you're young enough to see it, maybe in 50 years, that's it. We have understood that. Yeah, that would be brilliant. <laughs>
And this final concept maybe give me the opportunity to ask the question that I had in mind, yeah. yes. which is a question that comes from the students as well, because they were asking, um, please ask uh, Professor Kello, um, how does he see uh, the, the, the young generation in the perspective of the future? What are their potentials? Wow, I think the, the, um, as a teacher, uh, uh, the energy, the potential, the idea are, are on the young side. It's not anymore on me. I used to say I'm, it's not, I'm not the one that is giving any clever ideas. The clever ideas come from younger people because they're fresh and they have this build-up uh, mind. Um, so, so it's essential. That's why, um, that's why I'm teaching. I keep teaching because it's essential. We have to prepare the next generation. So, so the, 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 the young generation is essential, is the future of the humankind. I'm, I'm glad that they seem to be much more aware than my generations about the global warming. And I mean, I see the difference, but in my times, yeah. Nobody cares about yeah. that stuff. I know no, there's much more awareness about where, where you're living, or using your car, and this yeah. and that. I think this is good. Um, there's a lot of pressure I know, from, from, from the young people, and we have this uh, few, uh, few examples with, uh, with Greta, for example, yeah. all this. So this is good. So I think uh, the future is in their hands. So I'm, 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 I'm hope, I, I hope they don't get the feeling that everything is set up. I mean, they can do whatever they want at some point. I uh, just up to them. And by asking this, um, the sensation is that they need some kind of uh, hope feedback. Yeah. Because everyday news, uh, you know, negative, pessimistic a bit about climate change and everything. So maybe they need some hope. I think well, they, need yeah. to under they need to understand that they can impact there if they want. They can actually participate, making a difference. Yeah. They, they need challenge. to trust that uh, because yeah, yeah, it's actually their the future. The question of the, the, the impact is interesting because we all have impacts. Of course, we can't have impact on the size of the country, but it doesn't, doesn't mean anything yeah. because you will never see it. But you can have impact on your friends. We know that. You can advise your friends. You can have impact on your family, depending mm -hmm. on you behave, how you build your family, uh, how, you, how you just deal with your family, how you build up your relation with your family. And, and, and already at that level, we can have a huge impact. So I think if everybody is being already focused on that, that would be a great progress because society would be much better already. So on a, at, at local level, we can have an impact and we should really care. We should really care about the family, we should care about our kids, we should care about our friends. We should try to understand why, if we disagree, why we disagree. We should try to have an happy life on yeah. that. Now, if everybody, I mean, are doing this, I do think that, that the society, I mean, will improve. Of course, the new system is built up on on news event, which build up on something which is visible. So you're not going to always say, oh, he had a, a, a birthday today. Oh, I got this. Is, oh, the flower is growing in the garden. It's not very good for the media. It's much better to say, oh, there is something awful that happened here. And of course, there are awful things. That's pretty clear. So it's up to you. It's the usual stuff with the glass. I mean, you have the glass half, half full or half empty. It's up to you how you want to see it. But we all have impact at our own level. Everyone has an impact. When you talk with your friend, you have an impact. So think about your own impact first. And then you will maybe see life a different way. Yeah. And online, one special student wants to know if he will, we as a humankind, ever be technologically able to reach beyond our galaxy. What oh. do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is a very difficult question, and it's a difficult, I mean, you never know, uh, because when you're talking about a very long time, I mean, if you go back 10,000 years ago, we, yeah. we barely had cities. So, so it's clearly we have, the technology can do a lot. And um, um, the usual example I, I'm giving is, um, if, you, if you compare in the 13th century, or maybe the 12th century, 11th century, when they started to build cathedrals all over Europe, it was the, the pinnacle of the culture, of the architecture, of the technology to build this cathedral. It's amazing. It was the biggest stuff you could build at that time, the most complex stuff you could build. It would take 100 years to build such a building, and many, many generations on top of each other. So, so the equivalent today of a cathedral that kind of uh, encapsulates all the, the, the technology 
which has the same size, about, is a cathedral which is flying in orbit, which is called the ISS, space stations. It's exactly like a cathedral. It has the same size. Um, it's, it's, you need a lot of people, a lot of technology to do that. Well, imagine yourself being in a cathedral 1,000 years ago and, and telling the, the people, oh, we're going to fly the cathedral <laughs> in orbit around the Earth. Uh, people would look at you and say, he's crazy, he's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so, so we, we can do that because there's a lot of technology that we, we, we found in the meantime. So, so I cannot answer the question whether it's feasible or it's not feasible. No, but what I can answer is, what are the limitations of the physics? Okay, the limitation of the physics is the speed of light for, for, to, to move things around. You can go, in a way, faster than the speed of light, but not to move stuff around. So, so it doesn't really move stuff around. So if you want to move anything from here to there, the speed of light will be the limit. So the very nearby stars, they are at least within a couple of year, years of speed of light. So it's really kind of long distance. The moon is one second. Give you the scale. Yeah. Right. Now, the technology we have right now, we need about two, three, two to three days to go to the moon. Between one second and a couple of years is one billion so it's one billion seconds, so it's just impossible. So the given technology is impossible, it will take forever. Now, um, yourself, as a, as a as biological entity, we, are, we have been designed to live on Earth, only on Earth, because we have evolved on Earth, we've adapted on Earth, and we pretty much well adapted on Earth. Time to time we have some virus, and we're having this, but it's still <laughs> the, 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 the the kind of life system that is, is pretty much good at surviving on Earth, uh, if you don't mess up too much with the Earth. Um, now, we're not designed to go away from the Earth. When people mention, oh, let's go to Mars, uh, I think it's irresponsible. I mean, we're not designed to stay on, on Mars. The temperature, the, the level of irradiations make Mars impossible for us. We'll die on Mars. So of course you can send robots, you can maybe genetically transform the human body and to make it surviving, then you evolve a new species. So maybe there will be a new species going to Mars. But moving to the other star will take a long, long time. The galaxy is 100,000 years, so it's a really long time to cross it. Now, even, even this will be a challenge, even if you think there is a technology that reaches this speed, because there is another rule in physics that says that the mass of your your, when you want to move around, um, will increase if you get closer to the speed of light. And it's not a small increase. It goes really quick in a way that it becomes infinite when you read the speed of light. So already getting 10% of the speed of light, it makes the mass much bigger. So you can imagine you have to fly something, it becomes heavier, and then you have to break that stuff. So where do you get the energy to break it? So it's really, really impossible right now to be done. So I think moving between the star is really impossible. Living on another planet in the solar system is irresponsible because we're not designed for that. So I think we should better take care of our Earth, a bit like we have to care, take care, I was mentioning, our friends and the like of them, because that's, that's easy. It's much more easy to do that than to, to go somewhere else. Well, uh, do you want to ask a last question so that we don't take too much of your time? Uh, another question for me? If you want. Yeah, that's, that's your time. Yeah, that's your time. <laughs> um, I don't know what can I ask Five. particularly. Um, at my age, uh, what's your first uh, idea of uh, future? What is your age? 18. I'm 18. 18. 18. Wow. 18. 18. Well, I had 18. Maybe it's had, another you know, idea. I you, yeah, when I was 18, I had the feeling I can do anything. Oh. <laughs> you know what? I still have the same feeling. Why oh. my body tell me I can't. <laughs> I need to sleep. I need to eat properly. And I cannot travel too much. Because uh, it's just otherwise it becomes more difficult. <laughs> 18, you can't do anything. Like. I know. <laughs> The world is in your hands. The world is in your hands. Just grab it. Grab yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, Didier, for this uh, Pleasure. interview. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much. And we will give this interview translated. We will yes. give it to all the, the schools in, uh, in my region, which is uh, Le Marche, in good. Italy, in the center of Italy. And so for them to listen from your uh, word 
uh, Good. about the future, about science, about yes. the possibilities that these kids will have if they want to engage in any mm. STEM, so science, technology, engineering, yeah, mathematics. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much.